Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to your Lunch Break Live. My name is Ivana Harinkiw, if you're new here, and if you're not, thank you for coming back. Today is Thursday, January the 27th, and I have a fascinating talk today for you. Now, I am joined here by Dr. Jamie Locke. She is the Director of Comprehensive Trans the Comprehensive Transplant Institute at UAB, which is the University of Alabama at Birmingham, and I am also joined by Julie O'Hara, whose ex-husband became the first patient to have genetically modified clinical grade pig kidneys inserted into his body, transplanted into his body last year. Now this happened last year, but the first peer reviewed study of a procedure like this was actually published last week. So this is a really groundbreaking procedure in science, in medicine, and especially in the transplant world. Now this type of transplant is called a xenotransplant. It's spelled with an X. Don't let that trip you up like it did me. The xenotransplant again was performed in September, and this is just a worldwide story. Dr. Locke, I know this is something that you have been uh, doing shows and doing interviews about across the world because this is groundbreaking. It's the first of its kind. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, it truly is. It uh, really represents hope for all of those patients out there with kidney failure, um, particularly given that there's not enough human kidneys to go around for all of them to achieve transplant. So we're really excited. I want to talk a little bit about Jim Parsons. So Jim Parsons was a 57-year-old who was a registered organ donor. Again, this is his ex-wife, Julie, who is also joining us today. And he was in an accident. Julie, I'll let you kind of tell us a little bit more about that. He wanted to donate his organs and he ended up becoming brain dead. Now he, though, even though he was brain dead, that was not the end of his journey here. He's contributed to science in a way that I don't think uh, anybody else has has had such an impact as Mr. Parsons, being this person who received the transplant of these genetically modified clinical grade uh, pig kidneys. So there's a lot to unpack here, Julie. I want to ask you about Jim, about what he was like, and about what he would think about being part of a study like this. But first, Dr. Locke, I kind of want to get into a little bit of the details of how this happened and how this works. Absolutely. Um, so if you can sort of envision, if you will, we tried to recapitulate exactly what would happen in human to human transplantation. So there was a team of surgeons at our pathogen free facility uh, where these uh, gene edited pigs are um, bred and housed. Uh, and that's what gives them the designation of clinical grade. So because they are um, bred in that facility, um, they have a very low risk of any sort of disease transmission, which is really important. So there's a team of surgeons there. Uh, there's an operating room suite at the pathogen-free facility. Uh, they recovered the pig's kidneys at, that, uh, at the pathogen-free facility. They packaged them in cold storage, just like you do a human kidney. Uh, and they transported them to UAB hospital, just like we do human organs. Uh, they were unpackaged and prepared uh, on the back table. And that just simply means where we have to kind of get them dressed up, if you will, so that they're ready to be implanted or just be sewn in place. Uh, and then we had the extraordinary privilege of transplanting these pig kidneys uh, into Mr. Parsons in the exact same location uh, you would transplant a human to human uh, kidney. And so we really recapitulated every single step. And to say it was remarkable is probably an understatement. I think we all held our breaths as we took the clamps off and watched uh, Mr. Parsons' uh, blood restore flow to the kidney. And within about 20 minutes, the kidney, the pig kidney began to make urine uh, inside a human being for the first time uh, in human history. Uh, we were pretty excited about that, I think, in part because of just the extraordinary hope that that gives so many patients who need an organ for transplant. Uh, so just very, very exciting. Over the course of the next three days of the study, we were also able to show uh, that we did not transmit any pig viruses to Mr. Parsons. That was really important uh, be, to be able to demonstrate that. And we also didn't demonstrate any pig cells circulating in his blood, which is also very important uh, milestone and endpoint. And these are things that we want to be able to know before we take this into a living person. And if we back it up a step further, the other thing this study did that is really significant is we developed a novel flow cross match. And what is that? So in the context of human to human transplantation, one of the things that we're required to do prior to proceeding to transplant is to make sure that there's a good tissue match between the donor and recipient. 
Well, no such test had ever been developed between a pig and a human. Uh, so we developed that here at UAB. We predicted that this pig kidney would be a good match for Mr. Parsons, but the only way to validate that assay was to actually do the transplant and demonstrate that the kidney turned beautiful and pink and made urine as opposed to turning black because it had been acutely rejected. Uh, so just an important major milestone moving us forward on our journey to try to take this into living persons. Well, and it's important to note, again, this surgery was performed last year, September the 30th, but uh, the university waited until this was peer reviewed to release the results and to release that study last week. And so there have been other scientists to weigh in on this, and it seems like the world is equally as stunned about this procedure and equally as excited. Uh, there's some information in the re information that UAB released that I think is really interesting. And it says, I'll read it right here. It says the transplanted kidneys filter blood, produced urine, and importantly, were not immediately rejected, as you just mentioned. And the kidneys remained viable until the study ended 77 hours after the transplant. So those three days or so, it seemed like everything looked really good from a medical standpoint. Yeah, it really did. And, and being able to continue the study for that period of time allowed us to gather more key data that we will need uh, to be able to provide to the FDA so that we can obtain an investigator initiated IND. Uh, so in other words, that we would have approval to use this pig kidney in a living person. So uh, it's been very crucial and very critical first step for sure. And I think importantly, um, it was very important to us um, to have this peer reviewed. And what that means is that experts around the world had the opportunity um, to review our data, uh, validate it, ensure that they agreed that we drew the correct conclusions. Uh, and that's really significant because it creates full transparency. And by having it peer reviewed and published, it now can be leveraged by other investigators to further uh, the science in this area and hopefully get us into living persons much faster. Julie, this was uh, Jim Parsons was your ex-husband, who is the patient that this procedure uh, was performed on. And I want to ask you a little bit about him as a person. And one thing I think that was important to note first is people often are, we hear about people being organ donors. We hear about people also donating their body to science. This is something completely different. It's almost a combination of the two. Yes. Um, he, when we were married, he always talked about being an organ donor we had as a family. Um, because his parents were going to donate their bodies to science. Um, I, I don't know that we were actually going to go that route, but we knew we were going to be organ donors. Um, so when, when uh, he had his accident and we learned that he was brain dead, that is immediately what came to my mind was um, he, need, he needs to donate his organs. And that that's what came to your mind. I'm assuming he was taken to a hospital after his accident. Tell us what happened then and how you were approached about having Jim participate in this study. Uh, so we were actually um, waiting for him to have the surgery to have his organs that he was able to donate. Um, that it was supposed to happen about an hour and a half. And I got the call from uh, Legacy of Hope um, that Dr. Locke wanted to speak with me about this groundbreaking study. Um, and I happened to be in the car with my daughter and Dr. Locke, uh, we put her on speakerphone and she laid it out for us. And my daughter and I just looked at each other and thought, you know, wow, this is, um, th this would be an amazing thing if it actually worked and if he could be a part of it. And absolutely we're all in. What do you think that Jim would say about his body being used in this manner? On one end, it is fascinating. It is incredible. It's groundbreaking. On another end, especially for those of us who are maybe not in medicine or in science, it sounds kind of spooky. You read the headline and it just makes you stop and think for a minute. Wow, that's that sounds like Star Trek. Um, I think he would be 100 percent all in. If we didn't think he would be 100 percent, I don't think we would have done it. Uh, so I'm, I'm fairly certain that, that he would have had no qualms. He would have said, take me, do with me what you will save as many people as you can. And especially now you mentioned earlier saying, look, if this was successful, how cool would that be? And it was successful. Yes. So that I'm sure even more, uh, makes you feel validated in that decision. Absolutely. I remember the night we got the call. I could 
tear up right now thinking about it. Uh, Dr. Locke um, called me on the phone and she said, I have some wonderful, exciting news for you. And she told me about the kidney pinking up and producing urine. And, you know, we just all hollered and, you know, cried. And it was um, it was a beautiful moment. Dr. Locke, why Jim? Why Jim Parsons to do this procedure? You know, I'm not sure that we knew going into it um, who would end up agreeing to do this, but it clearly we knew from the outset that it was going to take an extraordinary individual uh, that had an extraordinary family, and that turned out to be the Parsons. Um, this has absolutely been, you know, a team effort start to finish, and a huge part of that team has been the Parsons family and their willingness to honor Jim's legacy, not just through the act of organ donation for the purposes of human to human transplantation, but also the willingness to allow him to really be a pioneer. Um, and this act um, has really now established brain death as a feasible preclinical human model. And when you put that in the context of science and medicine, you realize very quickly that this has the potential to extend far beyond xenotransplantation. There are many things in medicine and science that we need to be able to study, and we don't have ideal animal models to study them. And there are questions that we'd love to know the answers to before we put a living person at risk. And what the Parsons family did when they agreed to let Jim participate in this study, uh, they solved that problem for us. We have, I think, firmly established a preclinical human model, uh, and we would very much like for it to be known as the Parsons model. That was what I was going to ask you. Tell us about the Parsons model. And this is, again, Jim Parsons' name will go down in the history books in medical school for this procedure. But the Parsons model just makes it even more of a tribute to Jim. So tell me about that and about that name and what that means. Well, my hope is that it reflects everything that you've heard Miss O'Hara and, and the rest of the family describe about who Jim was um, you know, he was a wonderful person. He did things the right way. He was passionate about his family and about his community and about the sport that he loved. And I think what we've created here reflects those attributes of Jim. You know, we didn't enter into this lightly. Um, the discussions about using brain death as a preclinical human model began more than two years ago. Uh, we engaged external ethicists to review this, to help us develop protocols, to help us develop consent forms. And so it's important to know that, that we did that, in that under that umbrella and in that context for a reason, uh, because this model should never be exploited. It should only be used for good, and it should be done in the proper ethical context. And I think we accomplished that here. And so when I think of the Parsons model, I don't just think of the preclinical human model of brain death, but I think about the fact that it establishes how to do this in an ethically correct way. And from what I've come to know and learn about Jim, I think he would approve and be really proud. Julie, did you have any ethical concerns about this procedure? I did not. Um, when, we, uh, when we learned that he was brain dead, and we had said our goodbyes uh, around his bedside. Um, he, he, his spirit was gone for us. And um, what, what they were able to do with his body didn't have really anything to, to do with the spirit of Jim. His spirit was already where it needed to be. So in, in our, our family religious views. Tell me a little bit about what Jim was like as a person. Now, was he into science? Was he into things like this? Would he read about this kind of thing? Or was he just more interested in being on his bike, knowing he wanted to be an organ donor, but just kind of leaving the science up to other people? That was him right there. <laughs> uh, very fun loving. Uh, always the life of the party. Uh, the first one to crack a joke. And um, but yes, he was a motorcycle rider to his core. Uh, and he, he raced dirt bikes with his kids. He had them on bikes by the time they were three years old. Um, just, you know, just fun and, uh, wanted to be outside all the time. And just, uh, he, he would have done anything for anybody, anything. 
And I know that you have, uh, you and Jim had three children. So how do, how do your children feel about this and feel about just the Parsons model in general? They are so excited about the whole process. Um, this was, uh, this was a very difficult time for our family. Uh, it was not, you know, this was not an expected death. This was sudden and traumatic and, um, they were all very close to Jim. And, uh, so it's, it's been like we said, the end of September since this happened and we haven't been able to talk about it. And, um, we, you know, just talking about it with our family with Dr. Locke. Um, but as far as, you know, being able to spread the word about, Hey, look what, look what our dad did. They haven't been able to do till just now. And, um, to see the light back in their eyes and just, um, it's it's been truly a, a an amazing thing to watch um, how how they're uh, how they're how they've changed through all this and uh, I think they, they've they've come a long way with it. Sounds like they're very proud of their dad. They're very proud of their dad. Yes. Dr. Locke, question for you about just the future of medicine with this. We know that there are more people waiting for kidneys than are waiting for any other type of organ. It, some people don't even make it on a list to get a kidney transplant. And that list is not a quick procedure. It is a years long and sometimes even more than a decade long waiting list. So how could this affect the future of transplants? And realistically, how soon could we see this be a more routine procedure? Thank you for that really important question. Um, it has the potential to completely revolutionize how we care for end-stage patients. Um, it could el completely eliminate the organ shortage, which up to now has been really an unmitigated crisis. So just for context, you know, we know that kidney transplantation is a cure for end-stage kidney disease. We know it. Uh, at one year, there's about 95% survival. I mean, that is hard to beat in any other area in medicine. It, it's the real deal. Now imagine seeing patients in clinic, and we do that here at UAB five days a week, and we evaluate patients for kidney transplantation, and we know that many of these patients will die before they ever get an organ offer for transplant. And that's because there are 37 million Americans with chronic kidney disease, uh, many of whom will go on to progress to develop kidney failure. There are currently 800,000 Americans defined as having kidney failure, 600,000 of whom are already on dialysis, and yet we only have 80,000 waitlisted for a kidney transplant, and of those waitlisted, we perform fewer than 25,000 kidney transplants each year, and that's because there are not enough organs. So think about all those people that have had no hope and how this offers them the promise and hope for a future that they didn't know they were going to have. I think it's truly remarkable. Uh, and I'm very hopeful that we see it uh, in the near future. What's next on the horizon? For us, it's working with the FDA to obtain an investigator-initiated IND. Uh, this will give us approval for the kidney as a device um, and allow us, uh, with the permission of our uh, institutional review board, uh, to go into a phase one clinical trial. We hope to do that later this year as we have um, pigs at our pathogen-free facility that will be of appropriate size uh, for an adult human. Uh, and we hope to progress through the various uh, clinical trial phases so that if we hit every milestone, I think we could get there in five years. Realistically, somewhere between the five and 10 year mark, I would hope that we'd have full FDA approval and could offer this therapy to anyone in need. Well, look, in the world of medicine and science, that is a not a long time at all. It might sound long to the average listener, but in terms of medicine, it's it's not. Now, you say clinical trials. Do you mean a person who, unlike Jim, would be having a kidney disease, maybe an end-stage renal failure, and who would be not brain dead? Correct. Um, when I say a phase one clinical trial, we're describing doing this in a living person with end-stage kidney disease. And, and it should be noted that. Jim... Sorry, go ahead. Should... No, you're good. It should be noted that Jim did not have any type of kidney failure. He did not have kidney disease. And I believe that, uh, Julie, you actually said his kidneys were donated. Yes, they were. It's um, he when they took his kidneys out to put the pig kidney in, his kidneys were uh, were donated. 
Dr. Locke, another question for you about the pigs. Now, we see, again, this just this study, this headline, and it is amazing. But something that I think could probably trip people up is the genetically modified part of this. You talked about the clinical grade pigs and why they are considered to be clinical grade. But what is genetically modified about them? Well, it involves 10 gene edits, hence the 10 GE pig. Um, there are four genes that were knocked out. Um, three of those genes really relate to trying to prevent hyperacute rejection. One of those genes knocked out the pig growth hormone receptor. And the reason that needs to happen is so that the pig kidney doesn't keep growing, thinking it's in a thousand pound pig, because of course that would outgrow its uh, new human recipient. Uh, and then we actually knocked in, if you will, six human transgenes. And these genes are really designed to help modulate or help us control the human immune system. Uh, and so to really prevent uh, rejection further down the line. So that's the reason for the edits. Um, and to make the pig kidney human enough uh, that we could do a compatible transplant using standard immunosuppression that we currently use in human to human transplantation. That was one of the most interesting parts to me of the study uh, that I have read from UAB, at least the uh, not maybe a scientific study, but the information that UAB has released about the procedure and how it was the exact same type of procedure and type of uh, preliminary arrangement that you would make for a human to human transplant. You did essentially the same steps. It just instead of being a human kidney you were using was the pig kidney. Absolutely. We felt it was really critical that we be able to test operationally every component of our xenotransplant program from uh, the pathogen-free facility and the operating room suite there to our ability to package and store uh, the pig kidneys um, and keep them viable for transplantation down to actually doing the transplant in the exact same way we would do in a living person. Uh, we felt that was really critical to be able to recapitulate that uh, and so we're really pleased that we were able to do so. And I think this will be really key, vital information uh, that federal regulators are going to want to see and feel comfortable with to grant that approval that we need. Dr. Locke, any type of timeline for when this could be used for other organs, maybe hearts, lungs, liver, and other organs that people are on the organ transplant waiting list for? Yeah, I mean, I think hearts are, are right there in the hunt, as you probably uh, read at the University of Maryland. Uh, they got an emergency authorization and they took a heart from a 10 gene edited pig. So our, like our pig uh, and successfully transplanted that into a living person. Um, and that patient is still currently alive. Um, there are going to need to be additional uh, requests of the FDA to grant larger approval so that that can also move into a phase one clinical trial. But I think heart and kidney uh, are certainly leading the pack. But without question, we are interested in liver as well as lung. Uh, imagine one pig being able to restore the lives of two patients in kidney failure, a patient in liver failure, a patient in heart failure, and in lung failure. How remarkable uh, would that be? And uh, we are certainly, I think, well on our way. Julie, if you could leave people with one thing to know, whether that is about the Parsons model in general, whether that is about Jim as a person, what would it be? Uh, Jim was an amazing person. He's got a, a, a great legacy to leave behind. Um, but I think the thing that, that we really want people to, um, to get from this is become organ donors. Save as many people as you can. I think that's what we want. We want to save lives. Dr. Jamie Locke, Julie O'Hara, thank you so much for your time today for explaining this to us and really kind of shining a light on the, the future of medicine here. And uh, again, Julie, thank you and your family for Jim's service here and uh, just for his life in general. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. Everybody watching, thank you so much and we will see you tomorrow.